Yeah, it's an older set of headphones. Um, so anyway, let's talk about the statistics. Most spinal cord injuries result from motor vehicle crashes. Now, just as a uh, caveat to everybody that's on this uh, presentation right now, you may not have heard me speak in the past. If you haven't, well, then this is going to be a good introduction for you. Um, I, I, I am on the committee. It's a voluntary committee, but I am on the committee that writes questions for the National Registry. And we're in cycle five right now. Uh, the cycles go for six cycles. Uh, they are generally in three to five year increments where questions start appearing. 2020 will be the beginning of cycle six. At the end of cycle five, we started noting changes in nomenclature for spinal cord injuries and such. And so what I'm going to introduce to you for 2019 and all those who are going to take the National Registry exam for paramedics in 2019 and 2020 is going to be reflected in the slides here and next month. This is going to be a two-part series on spinal cord injuries, the first being just a discussion morbidity and mortality, and what we define as positive, negative, and uncertain mechanisms of injuries, and then some routine statistics. Now, you will see these in the form of questions as it relates to detractors. In other words, you're given a question, and then you're given five choices. Those choices are called detractors. And you may see the answers as a specific detractor. You may see it embedded in another detractor. Uh, you may just see reference to it, or you may have to make some sort of interpolation or extrapolation uh, to, the, to what's being asked in the question. And the call of the question is going to be how you answer the question uh, or circle one of the detractors, if you will. Now that you're all taking exams on computers, it'll be which one that you designate, which answer. So when it comes to spinal cord injuries specifically, we talk about stats. We talk about most spinal cord injuries result from, and it could result in the way that I've got it framed here on the uh, slide. And it suspiciously looks similar to that on the, on the questions on the National Registry where, what's the most common cause of uh, spinal cord injuries? And it's going to be motor vehicle accidents, overwhelmingly, 42% of them. Um, uh, what is the most common cause of spinal cord injuries? And then they give you four choices. And one is falls, the other one's penetrating injuries, one is injuries from sports, and one is from um, <clears throat> uh, infection. And there, you know, it's not going to have the number one cause, motor vehicle crashes, 42%. So you're going to have to know what the next one is down to answer the call of the question. The call of the question is, what is the most common uh, cause of spinal cord injuries? Or what do spinal cord injuries result from? The most common. And they'll have it with or without the motor vehicle crashes on it. So it's always good to know the list. Motor vehicle crashes, falls penetrating injuries. When you get down to penetrating injuries or injuries from sports and such like that, they tend not to be tested, but the top two will be tested. Median age of a spinal cord injured patient is 38 years old, 80% of them are male. You're going to see that question on a national registry in the form of um, a 38-year-old male who's involved in a motor vehicle accident. A 38-year-old male was doing something on the roof you know, something like that. We're going to kind of keep it calm. We don't like to trick people on a national registry. We don't have trick questions. There's always something within the call of the question that we have, which indicates clearly what the answer is. This way, if you come back and say, I disagree with that question, we can point you to the sentence, page, chapter, book, everywhere that it is um, published and show you where the question is, is actually answered properly. So we don't like the trick you, we like to make it pretty straightforward. So when you read the call of a question, any person who's been in a motor vehicle accident or a fall, or anything that has to do with a spinal cord injury, uh, you're gonna be, you're gonna have to be suspicious of a positive mechanism of injury, whether it's a motor vehicle crash, a fall, a penetrating injury, or a sports injury. You're going to have to be familiar with that breeze. They're asking about a male patient that's been involved in a motor vehicle accident. I'd be better be watching for a spinal cord injury here. And sure enough, it's going to pop up. 
um, again, 80% of all victims or all patients that have spinal cord injuries are male. Now, 40% of the trauma patients with neurological deficits will have a temporary permanent um, uh, spinal cord injury. So of all the patients that are out there who are injured by every single mechanism possible known to man, four out of 10 of them are gonna have a spinal cord injury or a spinal cord injury associated uh, symptoms to their mechanism of injury. And so you're gonna to have to be aware that on the national registry, uh, as this cycle comes up, and we'll be talking about other things as the next six months progress, we'll be talking about what illnesses are gonna be the focus of the national registry for cycle five and cycle six now. Uh, you can be rest assured that spinal cord injuries as part of a trauma assessment is gonna be huge. And so you're going to have the distinct advantage over the next two years. If you take the National Registry within the next two years and you complete your course of study through PERCOM and such, that uh, trauma patients are, are going to have an emphasis on spinal cord injury. So the annual, uh, this is an aside. You won't be tested on this piece of it, but the annual cost of society exceeds $5 billion. That's per year. And the cost can be attributed to spinal cord injuries depending on severity, whether they're complete cord injuries or temporary, or whether temporary cord injuries or incomplete cord injuries and such like that. Uh, there's, a, there's varying degrees. A person who's transected their cord obviously have no prayer of, of recovering anything. Whereas a person who's just bruised their spinal cord could return as much as 80% of their spinal uh, deficit that they had on presentation. So how we treat them in the field is gonna be very, very important as to whether or not this person ever survives, if it is indeed a survivable injury or an injury that had a good chance of recovery and your care as a paramedic in the street contributed to the patient having that great chance of recovery from a spinal cord injury. In other words, you use the seat collar when appropriate, use the backboard when it was appropriate. You use the uh, extrication methods and the immobilization that you employ for those extrications and such. Uh, these are all gonna be very, very important uh, uh, paramedic activities that you'd be doing to help us determine whether or not this patient's gonna have a survivable or a deficit-free life. So, uh, let's see. Cost of lifelong care for a 25 year old victim with a permanent and severe spinal cord injury is more than 3.1 million. Now, when we talk about cost of lifelong care, you can put down your pencils for a second, just put your arms behind your head and just philosophize with me for a second. What do we mean when we talk about $3.1 million? 25 year old gets injured, he or she are paralyzed from the, let's say from the chest down. Um, so they still got their breathing mechanism that are still able to eat and bathe themselves and such, but their care is gonna be 3.1 million. Well, we're looking at wheelchairs every three to five years, uh, handicap, parking stickers, modifications for the vehicles that they use, accessibility into apartments or homes, and the new barricades, the new ramps, the new everything that you have to put in handrails into the bathrooms and such like that. And then there's the inevitable, I can't feel my legs or feet. I didn't know I scratched myself. And oh, by the way, now I've got myself in the SD infection. You got the person who has to self catheterize themselves. They can no longer get up and go to the bathroom. They have to put the catheter into their bladder. They have to train their bowels, they have bowel wounds and such like that. The infections that are caused by catheter insertions results in at least at least two hospitalizations for the first year and decreases as the subsequent years go on. You're looking at five and six day hospitalizations, sepsis and such like that, increased frequency of antibiotic use and such, as well as all the other medications that come with it. And then of course you've got the psychiatric piece that comes with the depression, major depressive episodes and things. Um, and then some of these patients of course, 
uh, have an increased medical problems as they get a little bit older, they're going to get hypertension, diabetes and such, but it's going to be exacerbated by the fact that they've had a permanent spinal cord injury. And those are the patients that have injuries in the thoracic or lumbar spines where they still have their breathing mechanisms and they can still use their arms, their hands and their leg, uh, arms and hands to do transfers and such like that. You talk about the patient who's got a neck injury who doesn't have their own breathing mechanism or have to go on ventilators or cart themselves around in a wheelchair with a portable ventilator on the back. And you're looking at almost three times the cost of a person who had an injury below their neck. So as an overall way of saying that uh, there's, there's truly some spinal cord injuries that are horrible, and that would be the high neck cervical injuries. And so once again, it be, becomes incumbent upon the paramedic to recognize the patient who is at risk. In other words, a positive mechanism of injury, who is at risk, high risk for spinal cord injuries to have proper mobilization techniques, proper care in the field uh, to maximize their opportunities to have a normal, at least a normalized type of life. And this last statement that I have here, the injury prevention strategies can have positive effect on incidence, morbidity, mortality, associated spinal trauma. That's gonna be in one of those all-inclusive type questions that you're gonna have, where it's gonna say of the following, and they'll say A, B, C, or D with E being all of the above or none of the above. So the statement that you see here is pretty much verbatim what you're going to be seeing on a National Registry exam in that the injury prevention strategies can have a positive effect on incidence, morbidity, mortality, associated with spinal trauma. Injury prevention strategies can have a positive effect on childhood trauma, head injured patients, orthopedic injuries, it just however we decide to phrase that, it's going to start with injury prevention strategies can have a positive effect on the following, which would be head injuries and orthopedic injuries and spinal injuries and all of the above. So that's that's the second giveaway question I've given you here right now on the National Registry. Okay, anatomy review. I'm going to take this lecture up to uh, the point where we're going to start discussion treatment. What I want you to do is over the next month before our next round table is to make sure that you're familiar with the anatomy and most importantly, familiar with the dermatomes that come out of each spinal level. So that when you call me up on the phone and say, Hey, we're en route to your hospital, a 38 year old male had a fall from a roof and he does not have any sensation around his umbilicus is not moving his arms. I'm sorry, not moving his legs, but can move his arms, conscious alert, or anything times four. I'd be able to tell right away that, okay, this is probably a T10 injury. This patient should be on a backboard. This patient was walked to the vehicle. First of all, it'd be a miracle, but second is um, it would give me a pretty good idea what to expect as well. A T10 fracture uh, could also have injured the celiac axis, the aorta, the uh, stomach pancreas, diaphragm, things like that. All of those areas are right at T10. So it's going to be really incumbent upon you to know over the next month, especially when we talk about next month's roundtable, is what is the anatomy and what are the associated injuries with it? So starting from the beginning, let's just talk about the spinal column itself. It's composed of 33 bones, as you can see in five sections, a cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccygeal spine. And each one of them uh, have a very specific number of vertebrae associated with them. At each level, nerve comes out uh, from that level out of the uh, uh, foramina, disc space area down into the respective areas. For instance, C3, C4, C5 uh, send nerves down into the diaphragm to help us breathe. C5, C6, C7 send nerves down into our arms. And L1, 2, 3, and 4 send, and 5 send uh, nerves down into our thighs and down into our lower legs and down into our feet, etc. So knowing, and then the thoracic spine just innervates all the chest, chest muscles and abdominal muscles through uh, T12. Um, you'd be able to 
uh, tell me at what level, if I were to say a person with a C6 uh, cervical injury, spinal cord injury, where would the deficits be? And you'd have to explain to me, all right, let's see, at C6, uh, well, probably the, uh, let's see, the second, third fingers, and maybe some flexion extension at the wrist, you know, would be weak, such like that. Whereas if I told you there's a C5 injury, you would say the patient would be able to shrug their shoulders, move their upper arms, but can't move their lower arms because C6, C7, C8 uh, do, the, do the hand. Now you, you may have mentioned that, or you may have noticed that there are seven cervical vertebrae, but I just said C8. That's because in the cervical spine, the spinal, the nerve that comes out representing that certain spinal body, such as C1, comes out above the vertebrae until we get eight cervical nerves that have exited. C8 comes out below C7, and then T1 starts right away underneath, T2, T3, and they all come out from there on out underneath. So when you do a review of the cervical uh, spinal cord, just notice that there's eight cervical nerves, even though there's seven vertebral bodies, but the rest of the nerves in the uh, vertebral bodies line up perfectly, number versus uh, number of uh, uh, nerves and the number of vertebral bodies are the same. All right, so we keep going down. As you look at your studies, I want you to pay attention to vertebral bodies. Those are the bodies that sit in front of the spinal cord. They protect the spinal cord from front injuries and such, but they also uh, allow us a certain amount of flexion and extension. In between each one of the vertebral bodies are intervertebral discs. They're like real hard cartilaginous pillows that pad in between the disc areas. You may know somebody who's got a real bad back or has got disc herniations or had to have a spinal fusion and such. It's because those discs have completely collapsed and they've herniated. And as a result of that, they've come crunching down on top of each other. And as a result, have cut down onto the nerves that are there as well. Once they put impingements on those nerves, they get anything from shooting pain into their legs to numbness and tingling into their legs to finally uh, loss of motor function. So the intervertebral bodies not only are shock absorbers with the spine, but they also maintain space in between the vertebral bodies so that the nerves coming out of the spinal cord out of those intervertebral spaces there are not crushed down. And when you get into a good anatomy book or some good uh, diagrams online, make sure you understand why the intervertebral disc space uh, maintaining integrity as to height is important. You can see the relationship of the nerves coming out of each level. And then of course you have real thick ligaments that sit along the front of the spinal cord that attach all the vertebral bodies together. And then a real thick one behind that protects the posterior spinal cord um, so that the, any injury from the back has to press against that ligament. Um, that ligament protects against a lot of injuries that a person can take to their back and such like that. Spinal cord is not completely exposed in the back. Although if one were to look at it from an evolutionary standpoint, it's still a fairly weak area. I think uh, evolution can do a little bit better protecting the spinal cord. And maybe in a million years or so, humans will be impervious to spinal injuries. Although I hope in a million years, I'll, even if they're not impervious to spinal injuries, I hope that they're able to cure spinal injuries. In any event, let's keep moving. Um, this is anatomical description of the spinal column. By the way, Jane will provide the slides for, for you to be on the uh, uh, website. So if you wanna uh, take a look at them at a later time and such like that, feel free to do so. But each vertebrae, uh, transverse processes, posterior spinous processes, and of course the vertebral body itself. Uh, transverse processes, mostly in the lumbar spine, mostly in the thoracic spine and such like that. Uh, ligamentous processes, uh, I'm sorry, ligamentous, uh, uh, 
ligamentous bands, like long ligamentous uh, ligaments uh, in the anterior and posterior part of the spinal column. Uh, attached to each one of these spinous processes and, and transverse processes as they go down the spine. So that even though the spine is flexible with movement, there are limitations to the uh, spine being flexible. And that becomes very important when it comes to hyperextension, flexion injuries, and of course, side to side injuries or lateral bending. Okay, now you should know that the spinal cord is a solid bunch of nerves, millions and millions of nerves that come down out of the brain. And as they come down, they come to an end at what they call the conus medullaris. And that's about L2. The spinal cord itself ends at L2. Below L2 are the individual nerves coming out, but they're not wrapped in a tight band called the spinal cord. They're kind of loose, what they call the horse's tail or cauda equina. And that's why we do spinal taps at L3, L4, and such like that, because the needle's not going into the cord. It's going in a fluid that's got a, uh, <coughs> lots of nerves floating around in them, and the needle just kind of pushes the, the nerve away in the spinal fluid. But any fractures that are below L2, pretty safe to say, are not going to involve the spinal cord, although they could still have neural deficits, depending on which nerves have been cut. At least there's a little bit more room uh, in the uh, spinal canal there below L2 to allow the nerves to move about and perhaps avoid or mitigate uh, the severity of the injury. All right, so this, uh, the rest of the slide is going to discuss just the anatomical uh, breakup of the uh, spinal cord. You're not going to really have to know this for the National Registry exam, but you should know it from the standpoint of understanding how the spinal column works, how the nerves are distributed uh, that throughout the body from the spinal cord. And this gives you a pretty good idea that if a person has a deficit at a certain level, you'll be able to identify that deficit and then reason from that what level the spinal cord has been injured. <clears throat> Dermatomes was the big word that I wanted you to know here. Uh, the body, you're going to find that when you look at a diagram of the human body, when it comes to dermatomes, it's going to look like a horizontal zebra. There's going to be just stripes going all the way across telling you at this level C5, at this level C6, C7, ad nauseum all the way down to L5, S1, where S1 is your big toe, L5 is your Achilles heel, L4 is your knee, and moving right up to uh, the deltoid caps at C5, um, T10 at the umbilicus, T7 at the tip of the scapula, uh, T4 is the carina, so these are all going to be very important anatomical spots that you're going to kind of have to memorize. And then you can kind of reason in between of all those. But if you memorize at least the big toe, the knee, uh, the umbilicus, the shoulders, and the tip of the scapula, again, you can kind of extrapolate what dermatoma level is going to be innervated by that particular spinal nerve as it comes out from the vertebral body. Again, Entire dermatomal memorization is not necessary, but do know a couple of sentinel sites. Again, C5 at the top of the shoulders, the so-called deltoid cap. T4 is the carina of the lung. T7 is the most inferior part of the scapula. T10 is the umbilicus. And then down further, L1, L2, L3 is the anterior thigh. L4 is your knee, L5 will be the back of the calf in the Achilles tendon, and S1 will be the great toe. We typically refer to spinal cord injuries as a result of or related to the mechanism of injury. 
So high impact injuries, high incidence of spinal cord injuries, low impact injuries, low impact. Spinal mobilization for two specific patient groups. This is you're gonna to have to know on your exam. Uh, this is almost verbatim. Number one, unconscious injury victims. And number two, any patient who's had a significant high speed or high impact motion injury, whether it's the football player that gets hit from behind uh, and gets knocked out unconscious or after a hit cannot feel his arms or legs, whether this is a motor vehicle accident, which we consider to be a motion injury, uh, where a high speed, and I think most of that is really concerns itself over 30 miles per hour, um, over 40 miles per hour and over 50 miles per hour, we start seeing a real jump uh, in the number of spinal cord injuries and of course the severity of those injuries as well. So the faster, the worse it goes. But uh, for your exam purposes, both for PERCOM as well as for the National Registry, spinal mobilization for two specific patient groups, unconscious injury victims and any patient with motion injuries, um, are going to be phrased in a certain way and most of it's going to be absolute requirements for spinal mobilization include the following groups <clears throat> and you'll have to uh, pick out the uh, the two choices that i have there already okay now this is a potential for spinal injury you don't when they when we say potential for injury, we don't mean that that's exactly it. A 60 mile per hour crash, everybody gets out of the car and starts walking around and such like that. Yeah, airbag deployed, of course. Seatbelt, lap belt time, yes. Do you have any injuries anywhere? No, I'm a little achy in the shoulder. That's about it. Okay, and they're up walking around. All right, probably not somebody you're going to be putting in a seat collar. A uh, 20 year old overturns his truck, goes down into a ditch, eight feet down. He knocks out the window with his uh, shoes and he crawls all the way up the embankment and is standing there uh, when you arrive on the scene. Okay, spinal cord injury? Probably not. We would have figured that out eight feet down and it would have never gotten out of the truck. Um, those patients you could probably forego if you feel the back of their neck and you apply nexus criteria. And I'll spell that for you. N-E-X-U-S. It's gonna be nexus criteria for neck or cervical spine injuries. And you'll wanna look that up. We'll cover that next week. If, if you don't have time to look it up, that's fine. But if you do look it up, you're gonna find out what's the criteria that we use as emergency physicians to say, okay, I can clear your collar right now and not worry about it, or I can clear your collar and better yet, I don't even have to get an X-ray or a CT scan on the cervical spine. Versus a person who um, does not meet all the criteria for nexus and I have to keep the cervical collar on or you have to apply the cervical collar at the scene for that classification of patients which we term uncertain mechanism of injury or uncertain injury as a result of the mechanism of injury. All right, so this is potential for spinal cord injuries and it's not always practical in a pre-hospital setting to put patients on cervical collars and backboards and full spinal mobilization, especially if they're up walking around. They've already talked to the police. Now the police call the ambulance for you, take you to the hospital. So it's not make it inconvenient for the police officer to have to go to the hospital. So sometimes they're a little slow on calling for ambulances. <coughs> and the police use their common sense too. They see the guy up alert, you're walking around the car and such, you have a driver's license, registration, insurance, yep. Pass it to the police officer, okay, I'll be right back. Writes down all the information, gives it back to the guy and say, are uh, you feeling okay? Yeah, let me call you an ambulance. And then they call the ambulance. So we've seen that through ever since I started in the fire department in 1972. We've seen that with police officers where they uh, a little slow on calling ambulances because they didn't see anything bad. Now, a police officer uses common sense, obviously. He goes up to the car, he sees people unresponsive and such, he's calling for an ambulance right away. Um, but look, if the police officer didn't call right away because he saw the guy up and walking around, you know, take that as a kind of a into your 
arm of momentum of information that you collect when you arrive on the scene. If he's been up and walking around but still wants to go to the hospital, he can sit down in the back of the ambulance and take him in. No problem. Not everybody goes into a cervical collar. Not everybody goes into a backboard. But one thing you do want to do, again, N-E-X-U-S, you want to apply nexus criteria to these patients on the scene when it comes to determining whether or not you're going to put on a C collar. Okay. All right, traditional spine assessment criteria, signs and symptoms. Again, the National Registry has not changed on this. Any book that you read for the past five cycles, which would be since 2010, this is going to be the same. In other words, altered, altered level of consciousness. You're going to have to assume a spinal injury if they're altered. You can't. You can't ask a drunk person. You can't ask an intoxicated person. You cannot ask a impaired person. And you cannot ask a person who's just suffered a head injury who doesn't even know his name. Does your neck hurt? These are all distracting injuries or um, supervening causes. And subsequently, these patients automatically go into a C-collar. So what you're seeing there is spinal pain or tenderness, which is part of nexus criteria. Neurological deficit or complaint, part of nexus criteria. If you feel that there's a deformity to the spine, definitely a big problem. Evidence of drugs, alcohol, distracted injury, you know, femur sticking out of their mid-shaft thigh, out of their pants and everything like that, screaming and hollering in pain because the pain is so intense. They're not going to know that they have a broken neck. That's a distracting injury. So we have to make sure that these patients go into a cervical collar regardless. And of course, anybody who has an inability to communicate where the suspicion for a mechanism of injury has taken place. If you arrive in an apartment and a person's face down on the ground and there is a ladder that's over on its side and you see partially hung decorations, paintings, etc., cetera, uh, you can assume that the patient fell the patient's not answering questions for you. These patients go in a cervical collar. That's pretty blatant. It's pretty straightforward. The patient's calm, collected, sitting up, saying, I just hurt my ankle and such like that. Okay. Even though you fell off a 10-foot ladder, you know, they're probably not going to need a cervical collar. So this is where paramedic judgment comes in. This is why you're being trained to the level that you are uh, as paramedics. You're going to be a cut above EMTBs. And you're going to be field experience. You're going to be cut above many nurses. Uh, ER nurses will be your exception, but any other nurse that's out there, uh, you're going to have a, a training that's superior to what they're able to do under their practice act versus yours. And so you're being trained in a pre-hospital setting uh, to recognize these kind of problems and to avoid uh, anything that'll make the patient worse and stabilizing them in the best way possible to at least give them a hope of recovery intact. So in determining mechanisms of injury in patients may have spinal trauma, we classify them in three ways, positive, negative, or uncertain. This is the new method, 2019. Welcome to 2019, here we go. It's combined with clinical criteria for spinal injury and can help identify a situation when spinal mobilization is appropriate. That's verbatim out of some place, isn't it? Certainly sounds like it, so I would know it. When in doubt, use full spinal precautions, and please, please put parentheses around this one as well. Highlight it, asterisk, put the word VIP next to it. When in doubt, full spinal immobilization. But when determining the mechanism of injury in a patient who may have spinal trauma, classify them as positive, negative, or uncertain. Now, when you combine this with your clinical criteria, you can identify situations where spinal mobilization is appropriate. Again, very important to know this. When we look at positive, negative, or uncertain, <coughs> I apologize for the cough. This is killing me. Uh, when we classify them as positive, negative, or uncertain, it really means is what's the whole the totality of the circumstances? What does the whole scene look like? What does everything look like as we arrive on the scene? Uh, take it into account 
uh, everything from weather conditions, the bystanders to where the patient was found, what the witnesses are saying, such like that. Positive mechanisms of injury. I'm gonna linger over this slide for a few minutes because this is probably the most important slide that you're gonna to get today. Uh, two and possibly three questions just come off of this slide itself. There are forces which are exerted on a patient which are highly suggestive of a spinal cord injury. Any positive mechanism of injury, which is a motion injury, a fall from three times the height, motor vehicle accidents over 30 miles per hour, that kind of stuff, combined with findings of neurological deficits calls for a full spinal mobilization. Cervical collar backboard is full spinal mobilization. And so if you got a patient who fell, let's say you arrive on the scene and that same person in the apartment whose ladder is turned on its side is laying there, and you do your primary assessment. Can you feel me touching your back, your shoulders? Yes. How about your face? Yes. Uh, abdomen, chest? Yes. No. All of a sudden, it's no. Can you feel me touching your feet? Take a you know, little needle stick to the bottom of the foot and such. No, I can't feel anything that you're doing. Well, we got a big problem. So that's going to be full spinal mobilization. The stretcher comes to you. The backboard comes to you. Cervical collar is on the patient's log roll. He goes back onto the backboard. Backboard's picked up, put on the stretcher. Stretcher's then brought down to the ambulance. There's no cheating on this. These patients got a spinal cord injury if they can't feel anything from their T10 down or their T7 down or the nipple line, which is T4, which is the level of the carina. They can't feel anything down. Uh, these are big problems. And this does call for full spinal mobilization. And again, one in doubt, if the neurological exam is equivocal, in other words, you haven't decided whether it's negative or positive because he's giving you mixed signs and symptoms, I can assure you that's going to turn out positive until proven by CT scan and MRIs uh, till it's proven that there is no spinal injury. Now, you can have patients with but they saw Socorro, you don't have to write this down, spinal cord injuries without radiological evidence of abnormalities. And what that means is that the patient's got a bruised spinal cord, but the vertebral bodies are intact, transverse and spinous processes are intact, and what they call the anterior and posterior lamina are intact. In other words, the bones all look good, the spinal cord running down the middle of the cervical, thoracic, lumbar spine looks perfect, why they got neurological deficits? And the answer is, it's bruised. And subsequently, you can have patients with uh, neurological deficits, even though they've had some sort of traumatic injury, and yet there's no evidence of spinal cord injury itself. In other words, x-rays, MRIs, and CTs are negative. So the fact that you got a neurological deficit out there and then you bring them in and say, okay, the x-rays are negative, uh, does that mean that they've not had a spinal cord injury? Absolutely not. It means that we don't have anything that's transected the cord. We don't have anything where the fragments are retropulsed into the spinal cord. We don't have anything like that. But nonetheless, we still have neurological deficits. If it's equivocal out on the scene, but there's no step off or depressions noted along the spine and such like that, they still go in full spinal mobilization. Okay, so positive MOIs. Uh, this again is going to be one of those. <coughs> this is going to be one of those questions where they're going to give you an all of you of scenario. Or they're going to give you a four answers or five answers and only one of them is going to be correct. So know that any one of these four, you know, the last one being other high pit impact situations, but know that these four, as they're stated here verbatim, violent situations, blunt penetrating injuries, gunshot wounds, stabbing, such like that. Sports injuries falls from three times the patient's height, not two times, three times. High-speed motor vehicle crashes, anything over 40 miles per hour. 
uh, are considered high speed. And subsequently, um, these are positive MOIs. So you, what you're calling a report to us is you've got a positive mechanism of injury, a car crashes at 40 miles per hour, airbags deployed, the patient did state that they had lap belt and uh, shoulder belt harnesses on. Uh, however, <clears throat> during our exam, we find that the patient has this deficit. So all you gotta state is a positive mechanism of injury, here's the deficit, and you're, you, you've succinctly put to us exactly us as ER physicians. You put to us exactly what, what we can expect with the patient. All right, so every once in a while, I like to check in with everybody and make sure I still got everybody still awake. Um, can you guys all drop me a little text message real quick in the chat box to tell me that you're Albert, Amanda, Chris, Sherlinda, tell me that you're still with me? There's you got everybody? We can't hear you yet, Dr. Brain. We just heard some static and missed you. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. All right, is everybody here? Yes, sir. All right, very good. All right, so that's positive mechanism of injury. All right, so let's keep moving on. In the absence of signs and symptoms of spinal cord injury, some agencies may recommend that the patient with positive MOI not be mobilized. This, this we, we direct that based on your paramedics assessment. Now, do you need to call us all the time to tell us that you're not gonna mobilize somebody? The answer is no. We train you to a specific level. We train you with high levels of, uh, high degrees of confidence that your assessments and judgments out there are gonna be <coughs> right on. And should they, have any question at all, you can call us and ask us the question. Sir, we lost you again. How are we doing now? Yes, sir. We can hear you now. All right. All right. I, I got to get a new set of headphones. All right. So, Anyway, we train you to a specific level. We expect that you'll be able to evaluate these patients on the scene and decide that even though the patient may have had a 60 or 70 mile per hour crash, even though they fell five times their height, even though they've had some other sports injury where they've been stung for a few minutes, like a cervical stinger, a neck stinger, um, when they get hit, directly in the neck and they're stunned for a little while and they have a nervous system that's stunned for a little bit. We, we train you to that level to decide for yourselves whether or not these patients should go into a cervical collar or not. Sometimes a patient can have a positive MOI and, it, and not require cervical spine immobilization <coughs> or full spinal immobilization. Uh, that's, that's really gonna be up to your call. As an EMS medical director, I put it in the protocols that if you feel that this patient doesn't need it, then don't do it. If they're up walking around and they're happy, active, their nexus criteria is negative, they don't need a cervical collar. You can transport them without the collar or better yet, if they want to refuse, you feel much more comfortable with them refusing. If any of the nexus criteria are positive, you have to advise them that sir, more likely than not, you, you got a broken neck or some sort of problem there you'll at least be able to allow the patient to make a much more informed decision, especially the patient doesn't feel like they've been hurt, but they actually are hurt. So 
um, as an EMS medical director, I leave that to them. Now, should they have any questions, uh, you pick up the phone and you call us, and then we talk together as uh, doctor to paramedic, and just kind of run run over what you've got on the scene, and then try to answer your question the best that we can. More times than that, we'll. Uh, we'll side with whatever you're saying on the scene. Every once in a while, if you have a sincere question or you don't know the answer to it, we'll provide you the answers. Either way, it's a fail-safe way <clears throat> to not only minimize uh, risk of harm to the patient, but to minimize your liability as well. So, all right. Uh, we're coming up to the end here pretty soon, so hang in there. Okay, negative mechanism of injury. These includes... Uh, this includes all others. You had the high-speed uh, accidents. You had the penetrating and blunt trauma. You've had the uh, falls. And you've had any other things that may be considered an injury of motion, if you will. And so these patients probably more likely than not have a higher incidence of spinal cord injury or neurological deficit than the negative mechanism of injury. We're talking about isolated orthopedic injuries, uh, dropping objects on your foot, uh, hurting your hand, cutting yourself in extremities. Um, anything that didn't involve a high speed impact or even a moderate speed impact or a sports injury or penetrating injury uh, that was in the vicinity of the neck or the chest or the back area. These are negative mechanisms of injury. As you can tell, they're just from the examples. It's pretty self-explanatory, pretty, pretty safe to say that, yeah, I think I can identify a negative uh, MOI over a positive MOI. If I have any questions or comments, I can certainly call the DAC. But uh, if there's going to be a decision-making, it's going to be between positive and uncertain, but the negatives are going to be pretty clear that there are negative mechanisms of injuries. So uh, we don't require spinal mobilization, no backboard, no seat collars, uh, pretty much just transport and position of comfort. The uncertains are going to be probably your largest category. Um, this 60 mile per hour crash, it's going to at least give you an idea that, hey, I better do a pretty good job of uh, evaluating this guy's neurological status. And what I mean by neurological status is not only their mental status, but do they have any focal neurological deficits? The same way you would do it in a stroke patient, it's the same way you do it for this patient as well. Uh, you don't know if the impact of the force of the injury is unknown or uncertain. The patient's unresponsive. He doesn't know what the heck hit him. He doesn't know what happened. He's sitting on a street curb. You don't know if he's been uh, hit by a car or if he's standing against a light pole and a bus came by and the mirror hit the pole and caused the pole to rock back and forth, knocked him out, fell to the bottom, but the bus kept right on going. You, you, you don't know. You don't know what's going on. Or if somebody just even came by and took a swat at you. A uh, patient wakes up unresponsive and doesn't know how they got there. Uh, this would be uncertain mechanisms. So the clinical criteria must be, base, must be the basis that you use to determine the need for spinal mobilization. Um, again, it goes back to nexus criteria. And you're going to be tested on nexus criteria, I can assure you. We'll cover it next time, but I want you to look it up in the meantime. All right, when we assess somebody of uncertain mechanism of injury, um, we have to make sure that first and foremost that the patient's a good historian. Are they calm, talking appropriate? Are they talking so that I can understand them? If I don't speak the same language that they do, they may be calm and such like that, but if I don't know, I don't know. And so it's best to get on a translator line or get somebody out there who speaks the language of the patient uh, to better uh, understand if this person's alert 19 times four. An overwhelming number of times you're going to be running into patients that can communicate, and they communicate in a very <coughs> calm manner, and they're able to tell you exactly what happened. They have to be sober. They have to be alert oriented. Now, does being sober mean that they can have not have had a drink at all? The answer is absolutely not. Uh, 
you still be sober when you're below 0.08 or below. I mean, you're still considered so sober and you'd still be able to give a good history even though you've had a couple of drinks. It's, it's all going to depend on your um, common experiences, both watching yourselves as you've communicated when you may have been under the influence or watching other people as they have been under the influence and listening to the person using your all your experience that you've gained both as medical people as well as prior getting into paramedics and dealing with patients who tend to be impaired or intoxicated and whether or not their history is reliable look if they're standing there and they they sound you know they've had a couple of drinks and they sound s sober as a priest on on sunday and and they give you a good history and such like that you can roll with it um would one consider that a distracting injury? Pain responses are blunted, but they're not absent when a person is drinking but still sober. <clears throat> it's only when they become intoxicated over 0 0.08 where their pain becomes much more blunted and the higher they get, the, the more blunted the pain response is, but the higher the alcohol level is, the more intoxicated they appear and subsequently the less reliable their history becomes. Do they have any mental status changes, any distracting injuries that uh, open femur fracture that I was telling you about? <coughs> Could very well be the, um, the, the injury that has given them so much pain in one area that they can't focus on any neck pain or anything like that. So your physical exam is going to be paramount. And I can't stress that enough. Physical exam is going to be paramount as to these patients with distracting injuries. And, you know, if you want to, uh, of course, be on the uh, safe side with uh, distracting injuries, you can always put the patient in a cervical collar and bring them into the emergency department when we get there we can make that determination for you. You're never going to go wrong putting a cervical collar on. It's just that we see more harm than good putting a cervical collar on a person who doesn't have a requirement for the cervical collar. <coughs> I can tell my cough isn't going to let up here at all. Okay, so... The reliability of a patient not always easy to assess quickly in a pre-hospital setting. That's an actual answer that's on a national registry exam. Um, again, whether or not you see that specific question and answer, uh, it's going to be more likely if you take the uh, exam here within the next uh, two years, you'll more likely to not see this particular detractor. <coughs> that's the reason uh, the reason why we classify something as an uncertain mechanism of injury or the question is going to ask for the rationale why we put somebody in a full spinal immobilization under the following conditions and the answer will be because the reliability of the patient is not always easy to assess quickly in the pre-hospital setting. So that would be pretty much your answer. All right, I can see that my cough is not going to let up here anytime soon. I'm hoping it would. Um, subsequently, this is a good point to, to be breaking off anyway. Um, we're at the one hour mark as it is. So does anybody have any questions for me before we break loose? If you have a question, you can un unmute your microphone and ask it real quick rather than doing a lot of typing if you'd like. It's a small group. Albert, you still there? Unmute your mic and say hello. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, good deal. <laughs> Any questions for me? Uh, none, but definitely next week. Uh, the next one, I will have a few. Very good. I hope you do. Specifically, we're going to ask you a couple questions about dermatones, Albert. I've already got you written down here. So for you're going to need dermatones? to know your dermatones, right? Okay, no Amanda, what about you? You still there? Sorry, I was just trying to unmute. I'm still here. Okay. I think uh, next month when I am uh, uh, do this, 
uh, I'd like to hear from you as far as nexus criteria is concerned. Okay. I'll All right. Yes, sir. All right. All right. Very good. Chris. I'm here. Okay, Chris. How are you doing so far? Uh, learning. Okay, good deal. All right, you'll, you'll find that <clears throat> when I, uh, um, I give these lectures and such like that, I, I give it with a, an ear towards the National Registry Exam. I try to hear these lectures, not to so much give you the answers, but to give you what to expect. I know that when you hit the street, you're going to gain experience far above and beyond what any classroom can ever teach you. You know, there's just on one call, you could probably get a week's worth of education. Our objective is to make sure that you are competent enough as an entry level paramedic to hit the street. And so there, during your final exams and your final orals that you take with me, <coughs> you'll see that I incorporate a lot of things that I use in my round tables here to, uh, uh, kind of test you on, if you will, kind of tie in pathophysiology and such like that. So next week, uh, along with Amanda, I'd like you to tell me a little bit about the Nexus criteria. And then I'll ask you both questions about it. Okay. Are you meaning next week or are you meaning next month when you do uh, your sorry. next round table? Next, next round table. Okay, that's usually the first Friday of the month.